real treat to have all of you and have these wonderful panelists here with us today. Um, my name is Sam Jacobs. I'm a member of Resource Generation. Um, I live in New York. Uh, just a word quickly about Resource Generation, kind of who we are and what we do. Um, we're a network of young people with wealth who you know, are kind of rallying behind movements for social justice. Um, our mission is to you know, lift up and transform young people with wealth into uh, leaders to kind of fight for the equitable distribution of land, wealth, and power. Uh, I want to give my co-moderator and, and uh, esteemed colleague, Mia Jo Lee, a chance to introduce herself to you. Hi, my name is Mijo Lee. Um, I am the Executive Director of Social Justice Fund Northwest. We fund community organizing in a five-state region um, in the Northwest. Uh, I use she and her pronouns, and I um, am excited to be part of this webinar um, because I, I do think that there's a great deal um, that we um, can and must learn from right-wing funding, um, both about what to do and what not to do. Um, and that we often, my experience working in philanthropy and in social justice movements is we often act like we're the only ones doing it and the right wing is somehow like a force of nature that doesn't, isn't made up of humans making decisions and writing checks and, you know, having meetings just like we do. Um, so let's talk about that. Um, I am going to do very little talking about that. I am uh, going to play a pretty, mostly a backseat role uh, today, but I'm super excited to have these smart people with us. Yep, just to kind of expound on that a little more. So we're, we're here today to, to talk about right-wing philanthropy and specifically right-wing movement philanthropy. It's a topic that you know, gets discussed in, in kind of certain terms, uh, but, but it really impacts all of us. Uh, some of the characters in the story we might know well, you know, there's the Koch brothers, the Mercer family, uh, Sheldon Adelson. Um, others have, have been moving money and wielding their influence from the shadows. Uh, it's easy to think of these donors as some sort of kind of caricature billionaires motivated by just greed. Uh, but in our conversation today, we're more interested in seeing if there's something that we as progressives should learn from them. And I think the fact is that those of us who are in the world of philanthropy have a lot to learn. Philanthropy on the left, you know, progressive philanthropy didn't stop Donald Trump. Now, you could argue that philanthropy never really signed up to take on you know, this kind of authoritarian phenomenon. Uh, and some of us here you know, want to make space, might think that philanthropy is at its best when it's apolitical or nonpartisan. But even if progressive philanthropy uh, couldn't stop the rise of Trump, the right has used philanthropy to fuel the movements that got him elected. Right-wing movements also offer lessons to those of us here who aren't funders. Uh, we'll hear about a lot of familiar strategies that we talk about a lot here on the left of grassroots organizing, leadership development, long-term visioning, implemented with full force and full support from the funders. I'm incredibly excited we have here some of the brightest minds in the movement for social justice to share their experiences organizing on a political landscape made uneven by the rise of dark money in politics and in social movements. They bring decades of experience together fighting the right and will key us into some of the strategies used by the right to unite their movements and to divide ours. I'm gonna kick it over to our panelists to let them introduce themselves. So I wanna uh, give Tarso a chance to, to speak. Great, um, thank you for that. Um, Introduction, thank you to RG for the invitation to be with you all tonight. I'm really excited to have this conversation with all of you. My name is Dr. Sohamos. I am the executive director of an organization called Political Research Associates, or PRA, a group that's been around for 35 years. Um, it's a movement organization. It's a progressive and left movement organization that monitors, studies, and analyzes right-wing social movements in order to support social justice movements to better understand and overcome their opposition. Um, but a couple quick notes about myself. Um, I would just offer that I come by my preoccupation <clears throat> with authoritarianism, honestly. I'm Brazilian born. I grew up in a family that had to flee the rise of the dictatorship in the United States. And what really turned my attention to um, politics in the United States, as opposed to international solidarity work, which is, which is what I grew up in, was the rise of the um, <clears throat> white supremacist movement and the Christian right in the Pacific Northwest. Um, in the late 1980s, which is about the time that I met the other two folks who are, are co-panelists co with me. 
Um, and so I've been doing work in one way or another uh, around organizing, researching, and, and fighting against the right wing since the late 1980s. Um, and I was recruited eventually to come to PRA, uh, which interestingly enough was founded by a philanthropist, uh, Gina Hardesty, um, who saw um, uh, transforming the world in a more socially just vision uh, is the work both of her um, philanthropy and organizing other philanthropists to do that work, and also the work of um, political research associates, uh, which she founded. And so, in a way, PRA was founded very much at the intersection of um, progressive and left-wing philanthropy and, and movement organizing and social transformation, which I think is very much the topic of our conversation this evening. So I'm glad to be with you. Great, thanks, Suzanne. Uh, I'm Suzanne Farr, and I'm very happy to be here. Thanks, thanks for inviting me. Uh, I thought that I would give just a little bit of a synopsis of my journey to to this point of you know how I, how I came to work against the right and devote much of my life to that. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, I worked for a scrappy little organization in Arkansas called the Women's Project, and we we worked on the elimination of sexism and racism and economic justice and we never talked about one without talking about the other. And we, our, our goal was to, you know, work on structural racism and sexism. So we're going along in that, and uh, the Good News Methodists attack us. And the Good News Methodists is a group within the Methodist Church that formed around that time. It was a right-wing group. And so we came under attack, and that led us to monitoring the right, because no one in Arkansas was taking a look at the Klan, Posse Comitatus, and all of those folks that were around. And so we took that on. And at the same time, we started a, a group in, in our organization called the Women's Watch Care Network, where we went around the state and created little groups of people who, that would also monitor the right. And we made those up of people who would look at sexist violence, racist violence, anti-gay violence, anti-religious violence. and. Um, so that led me, the work of the Women's Project was intersectional and that led me to more intersectional work, but particularly looking at how the right works. That work, of course, then led me to Oregon to work on No on Nine, which was attacked by the right wing against the LGBT community. And my job there was to work with some others to fr reframe that attack from being just on LGBT people to be seen as an effort to first of all, to be uh, seen as an attack on democracy and an effort to dismantle civil rights. Um, and that's how I met Eric and met Tarso and Scott Nakagawa, who might be on this phone call. Uh, I learned along uh, from them and along with them in that, in that process and came out of that sort of working strategy writer, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but always talking about the right and constantly talking about the intersection of gender, race, and economics. And so I continue doing that, but for the last seven years I've given my time to the Southern Movement Assembly in the South, which works together to bring, you know, 100 plus organizations, develop strategies together, political education together, uh, political analysis and principles of unity to create a much larger movement than what we have in the South. Great, thank you, Suzanne. Eric, go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. Yes, hello everyone, and um, thanks to Resource Generation and me, Joe, and, and Sam for having us on this evening. My name is Eric Ward, and I'm the Executive Director with Western State Center, uh, based in the Pacific Northwest and the Mountain States. Western State Center works nationally to strengthen inclusive democracy by building movements, developing leaders, shifting culture, and defending democracy. It's institution that is 30 years old. Um, and I came into this work out of my punk rock roots, out of the LA punk rock scene um, in the 80s and relocated to the Pacific Northwest and in the mid 80s, uh, in the midst of a time where the, where the Pacific Northwest was facing a similar crisis that the nation is, is, is facing now. Uh, right-leaning totalitar totalitarian and authoritarian movements um, that were seeking to reshape democracy, um, intimidate vulnerable communities, um, and um, an attempt for them to uh, position themselves as an alternative 
uh, to much of the inequity that we see in our society, but it was an alternative that was forged in, in bigotry um, and racism. And uh, for over a decade, I worked uh, with individuals in urban and rural communities, um, organizing uh, local groups to help them respond uh, to what was happening uh, at the grassroots level. And so very glad to be here this evening and glad to be part of this conversation. Thank you all so much for sharing your, your histories with us. Um, Going to kick it back to Tarso right now. Tarso, you've been speaking a lot recently about the rise of authoritarianism in this country specifically. Uh, could you, you know, expound a little bit upon that here for us so we get a sense of the political moment that we're in right now? Sure, and I'm, I'm going to do it in a way that maybe links to this question of right-wing philanthropy. You know, in the in the late 1960s and early 1970s, um, before I was a, a political, an active uh, uh, political actor, um, conservative organizers, intellectuals, philanthropists, in conversations actually very much like this one right now, concluded that the United States, as they knew it and it, as they wanted it to be, was coming apart at the seams. And that serious, focused, large-scale and long-term action had to be taken to turn things around. From their perspective, you know, the country was falling apart. Abortion had been ruled legal. Black people were in the streets demanding social, political, and economic rights, as were women, as were LGBTQ people, Latinx, Asian, indigenous, many other movements. Support for U.S. imperial wars abroad was unraveling into civic strife. Elites were losing influence. And the younger generation was rejecting traditional social and civic conventions. Right-wing philanthropists and organizers formed partnerships in this period, and they set out to transform the United States and the world through a variety of strategies that involved shifting culture, building a new generation of anchor institutions that were capable of influencing culture, shifting media focus, um, mobilizing mass uh, constituencies, um, and affecting uh, organized uh, po electoral politics. Um, and they were successful, right? They were successful. Uh, they have transformed this country and they have transformed this world. Um, and if that was their low point, and they saw it as their low point, if that was their nadir, we better make sure that this now is ours, right? That things don't get much worse. That's our responsibility. This is our watch. I think this is, for many of us, our purpose, right, in this moment. Um, and so the U.S. is not unique, actually, in many ways, although this is specific uh, constellation of groups and individuals and organizations they built um, are, are unique. Uh, we are living, in fact, not only in the United States, but globally in a time of growing authoritarianism, right? So whether in the U.S., in Poland, where you know, 60,000 people will show up in the streets for a neo-Nazi rally, in Hungary, where if you're Jewish or you're Roma, you're simply not considered a member of the you know, the, the national body, um, Brazil, my country of birth, Turkey, India, we see in these countries and many other places a rise of increasingly authoritarian movements and governments. And each country and each situation is different, but there are some commonalities among many of these um, that I think folks here will recognize in the United States. But I, I, put it, I put us in this global perspective because I think there's a kind of American exceptionalism that thinks, oh, these are just dynamics within the U.S., this is a global period, uh, a moment that we're, we're experiencing. So three key factors in this. One is the rise of racial and ethnic nationalism. You know, racism, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, exclusionary definitions of who the pe who's the people, who's the legitimate people. Second, conservative religious mass movements that overlap with nationalism that are part of defining who the people are and also impose traditional regressive gender roles, misogyny, homophobia, transphobia. So whether that's the evangelical right in the US or in my home country, Brazil, whether that's the Hindu right in India, right? Whether that's other expressions of a mass base of conservative religious revival, um, we're experiencing that around the world. And the third key element, is the rise of an oligarchy of corporate and private wealth that's driving extreme inequality and suffering 
an extreme inequality in suffering that makes those first two movements stronger by, by putting them in position to offer false narratives about the cause of that suffering, right? The cause of that suffering is that elites are giving the wealth and the status of real Americans, real Brazilians, real Hungarians, real Polish people to undeserving and dangerous dark-skinned classes of people to women, to feminists, to gender, gender um, uh, uh, extremists, and, and so forth. So these movements are going around the world, and in fact, um, we see a, a decline in um, even sort of liberal indicators of, of democracies around the globe and, and the failure of uh, even sort of liberal, neoliberal democratic states. What are the stakes? Um, in our view, the view of political research associates, and certainly not just um, our view, in the United States, we're facing the most severe um, set of challenges to racial, economic, gender, justice, and the possibility of, of democracy since the immediate aftermath of, of the Civil War, right? When, the, when the, um, the granting through the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments of the Constitution of civic polit and political uh, rights to freed African, enslaved African Americans resulted in a rebel, democratic revolution in the country, particularly in the, in the South, the Reformation that was met with extreme racial terrorism and violence, um, and essentially the position of, of a, a one-party um, uh, dictatorship uh, across the, the South. We're, we're facing a, a crisis of those proportions um, in the United States. And I think it's fair to point out that in addition to these organized right-wing movements, there are demographic change, um, there's demographic change in realities that they're all playing upon. And the record of democratic societies surviving the transition in which the dominant racial and ethnic group becomes a numerical minority is not a good record. It's not a good record. So I think we're in the fight of our lives um, and we're in a fight for the future, not only in the United States, but, but globally. Uh, and that there's the rise of a kind of right-wing international um, of, of authoritarian countries uh, that uh, and authoritarian leaders Donald Trump is very fond of, um, and we could talk about those examples. Um, one of the challenges that we have in a moment of crisis like this is that by the time that there's a broad public consensus that anything like the collapse of even sort of liberal, inad fully inadequate democracy is upon us, it's too late to forestall that from happening. Our job is not to wait for that consensus. Our job is to recognize the stakes and to step into leadership, into that breach, right? That's the calling of this moment. That's the responsibility, in my view, of our time. None of us gets to choose the moment into which we're born or the historical moment through which we're going to live through. This is ours. Uh, and, and it seems to me that those are the, the stakes. And so as, um, as folks said back in the 1930s, the period of rise of fascism across Europe, starting in Spain, the only kind of anti-fascist that matters is a premature anti-fascist. It's people with enough foresight and political commitment to anticipate where things are going and a commitment to keep to prevent that outcome from taking place. So I invite you all, if you, don't, if you aren't already uh, charter members, to join me and the rest of us in being premature anti-authoritarians, premature anti-fascists, because it's in this moment the only kind that counts. Um, and I believe that the future is not written, right? I believe that the future is written by those um, who are decide to stand up to it to it and face it and be political actors. And I think this is a moment where we're all political actors, um, historical actors. I do believe that we're in a moment of kind of reawakening, right? Of potential reorganizing, not only around what we reject, but about an alternative vision for the future of this country, right? And for the globe. And if I could really simplify that, because people have different political visions and I'm not here to impose in mine on the rest of you. At root, we're in a fight for who's the we, right? 
who gets to be here, right? Who's the we, if you want to use the, 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 the rhetoric of the Constitution of the United States, who's the we and we the people, right? Are we going to let that be defined <laughs> um, in increasingly exclusionary terms? Or are we, gonna, are we gonna concede to the idea that for some to prosper, others must be dominated, right? Excluded or even eliminated altogether, which is sort of the politic of this moment? Or are we gonna replace that notion with the idea that we all rise or fall together and with a very multiracial, right? And otherwise inclusive definition of we the people. We're in a fight for the definition of who gets, who belongs who has rights. Um, and so that's not just a political project, right? That's a culture shift project. And unless we win that, who's legitimate, who gets to be here, we won't win on the political front, we won't win on the legal front, we won't win on these other fronts. Um, we're in a fight for the identity uh, of us as a people. I wanna close this part by um, relating that I was not that long ago at a gathering of um, organizers in the United States and across Europe, including Eastern Europe, and very rough places like Hungary and Poland, um, Turkey and other places that are much more difficult uh, in, in terms of uh, democratic organizing than the United States is yet. And I was pulled aside after the first day of the conference by an organizer from Hungary, um, where uh, the situation is quite dire, who said to me, myself and my, the people I organize with in Hungary are looking to you in the United States. Now, this was shortly after the election of Trump. You might, as you might imagine, my heart kind of fell into my stomach. I tried not to show my um, uh, uh, dismay on my face. And I just asked, well, why? Why, you, why would you be looking to the United States? What do you mean? And the response I got was, in Hungary, we have lost, at least for a generation, the fight as to who, who gets, who's Hungarian, right? If you're Jewish, you're not considered Hungarian anymore. If you're if you're a Roma or people used to call gypsies, you're not considered Hungarian anymore. We've lost that, right? The idea that this is a multiracial, or at least multi-ethnic society is lost from us. In the United States, you're having a hell of a fight about who's legitimately there in the United States, but you haven't lost yet. Um, and so you're a beacon of hope, right? And I think that's right. I think that's the fight of our generation is to define who's the we the people um, I think we must win, and therefore I think we will win, and I think it starts with um, serious uh, conversations like this one that recognize the stakes, but also recognize the opportunity out of us. Thanks so much, Tarso. Thank you for bringing that international perspective and, and historical perspective to the conversation, help us kind of see more clearly where, where we stand right now. Uh, Suzanne, I want to pass it to you. Um, you know, Tarso described this kind of this theme, when, when a majority becomes a minority, you have a society that's in trouble. And, and I kind of want to construe that generationally right now, right? There's a young, younger generation, young people are probably a bit more progressive. And, um, and yet, conservatives have, have dedicated a lot of resources to organizing among young people. Um, can you speak a little bit to that and, uh, and share some of your expertise around that topic? Sure. Um... So I'm, I'm going to talk about the right wing and young, pe young people and also about funding. And, you know, to begin, I think we, we know some of the many reasons that there's such interest in millennials right now. But certainly as we go up to these uh, midterm elections, we know that one of the great interests is because there are so many eligible to vote. And in 2020, that 40% of the population Voting, eligible voting, voting population will be millennials. So there's a, there's a contest to, to get them right now, but there's particularly uh, Democrats are contesting for, for those folks. So uh, I, I just wanted to talk about how the right wing has gone about this. It's not just activating itself now that is suddenly looking out and saying, oh my goodness, they're millennials. The right wing has had a strategy for, for years. And that strategy basically is to take the long view and the long path to build capacity to make structural and system change and to, to uh, actually change uh, the way we have our political alliances and to change our norms. So to reshape those political alliances. So the main way they have done this, uh, I would say the, their number one, number one way of doing this 
is to create youth organizations, both in colleges and high schools. More in, more in colleges, of course, but also in high schools. And I, I just want to read you off a little list of those, um, just a few of them, starting in 1892 <laughs> with the college Republicans. You know, that kind of takes your breath away. It's like, okay, I'd call that the long view. Uh, Young Americans for Freedom, starting around 1960. Um, Federalist Society, College Republican National Federation, Turning Point USA, Young America's Foundation, Young Americans for Liberty, Leadership Institute, and RA National Youth Education Summit. And my favorite title is Young Guns Action Fund Super PAC. Um, Center for the Study of Popular Culture, and another one <clears throat> that doesn't always get put on this particular list, which is the Campus Crusade for Christ. Uh, when you think of what has come out of those organizations, um, like in the Young Americans for Freedom, you know, starting up around 1960, <clears throat> this was William Buckley's crowd, and they wrote what was considered to be kind of the um, statement statement that laid out the principles for conservatism, moving into a new kind of conservatism at that, at that point. If you remember, in 1960, we were coming out of the kind of a rough, rough time in terms of uh, right-wing behavior. And it's in, that, it's in that group that also this is happening simultaneously, not quite simultaneously, I think it was 1962 that you had the Fort Heron statement, you know, Tom Hayden and the beginning of Students for Democratic Society. And also in this decade, you also have the creation of one of the greatest youth organizations going, which was SNCC. Um, but out of, out of that organization came Richard Biggery, out of the, uh, the Young Americans for Freedom at that time. And the Young Americans for Freedom had had tremendous success in getting uh, Barry Goldwater nominated for president and then campaigning for Barry Goldwater. Uh, in fact, one of the stories is that they had uh, a very large rally concert in Central Park and Goldwater was there. And, you know, they often refer to that as one of the big celebrated, celebrated beginnings. And why vig Vigory is important <clears throat> is that he looked around and realized that the movement needed, needed some way to move itself. And he thought not in terms of political organizing so much as in how to do communication strategy. And so created what we now know of as direct mail. And Vigory, I think, was in his 20s, 20s at that time. So he took that donor list from the Barry Goldwater campaign, which was only about 1,200 people, and started, rather than going to visit each of those, sent them mail, and then realized this was a way that you could take away some of that fear of fundraising, you know, that you could send, send people a letter, tell them, you know, those, those letters, and we use them too. You know, they basically say, this is how terrible everything is. Let me, let me tell you this big thing to be scared of right now, and then we're the people who can fix it, so send us money. So they have three points. How terrible it is, we're the people who can fix it, and send us money. Well, that has brought in a bazillion dollars into, into conservative coffers. And then um, I want to talk just a little bit about the Campus Crusade for Christ, which is an older organization, started in 1951. And it started here in the U.S. and then went, went worldwide. And so it, for being in, on college campuses, and it was, it, I, it was particularly in the South where I, where I grew up, it, almost every con college campus, you know, had some, some representation of uh, Campus Crusade for Christ. And, so as, as they, were, they were forming, not necessarily forming on right-wing uh, ideas, but definitely on a, con a conservative worldview, you, you had the counterculture began with youth organizing in it and the whole change of the culture in terms of music, in terms of uh, behavior, in terms of how we, how we saw the world. And so they organized against that, they countered that with organizers, they countered the anti-war protesters who organized and countered the SDS. They countered rock and roll by cre creating Christian music, uh, which you know is flooding through the radios now. And they were particularly disliked by feminists like me for their family, family values and anti-gay stance, you know, their, their, 
they took that position that men are, you know, have to, have to be the leaders of the family and woman has to be the nurturer. But when you think about them, they are the, the largest religious charity in the world and they don't create organizers. All the others are working on, on organizers and people to get into powerful positions. They create evangelizers for conservative politics and they have those moving moving much in a much easier way through an evangelical religious base. So this is how they this the right strategy. <clears throat> when I first started organizing it in you know the decade that we, we're going to begin with in 1960, it was for voter young people for voter reg registration registration, excuse me, and get out the vote. And then to to move beyond that, so get that happening first, then to move on that beyond that to training on conservative principles, how government works, leaders, developing leadership, and learning how to do policy development. They did things like purchase land and buildings for the use of young people for the, where, where these organizations would actually have a place, which is a very, very smart infrastructural thing. And then they gave them educational support. So when you think about college wasn't so, so expensive then, but as it is now, but to have that educational support, someone to pay your way to college, then provide opportunities for you and strategic placement in government offices. So people got trainings, they got internships, they got fellowships, all paid. And then to support their careers for running for office, you know, or to support their careers for running, or becoming lawyers. Because to, to develop young lawyers is part of very, very, very strong scheme to get the right where it wanted to go. Get. So the goal then is what? Get politicians elected who will structurally and politically change the course of the country and to win the Supreme Court. So we're right in the middle of watching that right now. <clears throat> and I'll add one other thing to the, that, that they did that doesn't quite go in that list, but the refiguring of public education, I think was a, a brilliant uh, strategy in the late 70s and the 80s to start taking over school boards, getting in charge of the curriculum and changing it, regulating who can teach, pushing for religion in school and teaching creationism, opposing everything, privatizing school, schools, attacking progressive teachers. Um, in short, I think an attempt to destroy critical thinking for young people in every place possible. And this, I think, was a monstrous strategy. And given what we know, those who can't think critically become easily shaped in the, in the people who have biased judgment. Um, so one last thing about that is they have major donors. They have major uh, think tanks. Those donors like the Koch brothers and, and Coors give out lots and lots of money. They outspend us as progressive people three to one. Um, they uh, have fewer uh, we have fewer, uh, they have fewer progressive, fewer conservative organizations. We have more progressive organizations, but they have more infrastructure. But the positive thing about this, and I'll try to do it like Tarso and end with a positive point, which is the demographics of this country are changing. That we are going to majority people of color and they're going to increase numbers of younger people. And so when we look at that, those two changes together, we think about how many young people of color there would be, how many, how many people are available to do what Tarso just mentioned, which is to work, organize, and help define who this country, who is an American, and who, what this country is going to be. So there's, there's absolute opportunity for us in, the, in this moment. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Uh, Eric, we'd love to hear from you. You've got a kind of illustrious uh, career that you spent some of which in, in philanthropy. Um, and, and I want to get a sense from you what the funding landscape looks like on the right wing and how it, how it compares. Yeah, so thanks, Sam. And, you know, I want to do that really quickly. So I'm, I'm going to have folks pull up, um, have you pull up the first slide um, for those who, who have joined us. So I, I did spend time in philanthropy and also as a grassroots organizer and, you know, funding on the, uh, 
on the right and left looks very different. Um, funding on the left and in progressive organizations tends to be primarily dominated by um, foundation giving um, or religious giving. You know, on the right, it depends what segment of, of the right politics we're referring to. I mean, there are foundations within right-wing circles. Some of them are quite significant. Most of them tend to be in the libertarian-leaning, anti-labor, right, attacks on, on government infrastructure. Um, but there are also those ideological foundations that tend to support attacks on uh, abortion rights, on the LGBTQ community, on immigrants, and, and on public education. I want to talk about a, a new trend that is emerging and, and emerging quite suddenly. And folks may be familiar with this from discussions around uh, the one-year anniversary of Charlottesville and, and the rise of, of the alt-right. The truth is, is that as the far right has mainstreamed, its strategy um, for funding has also adapted. What we know is that the alt-right, this broad right-wing coalition that is fueled by a white nationalist movement that is grounded in the idea of ethnic cleansing, is no longer mainstream. Over 11 million white Americans uh, now support the core values of the alt-right movement, even if they don't actually accept the alt-right term. That's over 5% of white Americans in this country. There is a massive increase of individuals running for public office. Uh, previously, in previous years, the Southern Poverty Law Center has never identified more than 20 individuals running for political office. That number today is now well over 200. I want to give an example of what the money flow now looks like within this slice of funding. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, sorry, we'll go back one slide. There we go. So I want to talk about Lou Bartella, who's running for Senate candidate in Pennsylvania. Lou actually has a long history within the John Tanton network of anti-immigrant organizations. These are organizations such as the Federation for Immigration Reform, Numbers USA. These are organizations that have raised millions of dollars um, from philanthropy, um, but they also have their own PACs. To give you a little bit of an idea, Lou Bartella has been, Barletta has been very engaged with the Tanton Network um, over the years. But between 2008 and 2016, he only raised about $8,500 from Tanton-related PACs. Next. This is currently Bartella's growth um, in terms of unitemized donations. When we're talking about unitemized donations, we are talking about donations that are of a small amount so small amount that they are no longer tracked. I want to bring people's attention to 2018, where Lou Barletta has raised over um, 800, almost $800,000 um, in small contributions. 350,000, nearly half, comes from out-of-state individuals. Now, I'd also like to point out to remember, if of that 800,000, we are only talking about dollars raised um, through July. Most dollars come in during the end um, of an election campaign, particularly ideological dollars. And so it is likely that Barletta will raise over a million dollars in unitemized donations. Next. Notice in, contra in, in contrast, the decrease in dollars from organizations including foundations. What this tells us, um, or what it might suggest, is that either foundations are beginning to move dollars in other ways, unitemized, smaller donations that can't be tracked, or these foundations are feeling the pressure around a growing number of candidates' relationships to white nationalists and have pulled away. 
but yet even has these foundations made pivot away or seek to not have publicity, the grassroots fundraising is taking the place and actually um, overtaking uh, foundation dollars raised by individuals over the year. Next slide. Again, this is just to kind of point out how the money flows and how difficult it can be to track. So what you're seeing here is the Federation for American Immigration Reform, who gives money to K.C. McCaplin, who also makes a donation to Luis McAlpin, who gives a donation to the U.S. Immigration Reform Pact, who recently made a donation to Lou Barletta. The money and the inability to actually understand um, where these dollars are moving allows it to be hidden in a way that doesn't allow us to be responsive. Next slide. Here are things we know. All individual donations, right, of these candidates. No organization was willing to go on record donating to these candidates. Most of the donations were from out of state. In fact, almost all the states are accounted for. Um, and, and what this tells us is that we may be seeing a nationwide strategy in grassroots funding to advance elected officials who are either embracing white nationalism or have embraced the tenets of white nationalism. The unitemized amounts of these dollars points to the possibility of an extreme right dark money flow. Next slide. This is merely just to, to give us an idea and to understand that the money flow can be difficult to track because we're relying on unitemized donations. Um, those unitemized donations are two to three times more than average. They are under, again, under that threshold so that donors are not directly disclosed. Again, what we know is that they rely on out-of-state individuals over terms, right? And that there is much less, less local base and support for elected officials who adopt white nationalist or alt-right stance who are running for office. Their dependence comes from outside. These fringe candidates tend to receive less from parties and donors and other organizations must, that must disclose their dollars. Next slide. What we also know here is that 90% of high unitemized campaigns in the states, right? So what I mean is candidates who have received unitemized campaign contributions, 90% of them are still alive in the general primaries as of August 28th. This includes though both progressive and extremist candidates. So I'm giving you a little bit of good news. Next. <clears throat> what we also know, again, is that these monies flow in ways that ultimately can be tracked if we can begin to build the infrastructure to track these dollars. Next slide. I also like to point out that conservative ideology and party giving is increasing steadily over the years. And this is a graph that points this out. Um, what we will see in 2018, again, <clears throat> is that that number is low simply because we have not been able to track yet the money for all of 2018. It is likely to exceed what we see in 2016. Next slide. This also just gives you an understanding of independent giving. Um, by ideological groups by year. So you can compare ideological giving by conservatives versus liberals. And what you will see is that we are very far behind in terms of our own giving. Some questions um, that we continue to ask ourselves um, as we understand that ideological giving on the right is significant in terms of a grassroots phenomenon is how is the funding for campaigns of extremist candidates changing in the post-Trump world? Next slide.
Next slide. We also don't quite understand yet what are the hidden networks that are supporting extremist candidates. Next slide. One of the questions we should be asking is, are, are extremist candidates being more successful at influencing policy? It also seems likely that the late ideological dollars that come into campaigns are a way that right-wing grassroots funding networks are seeking to anchor their influence over candidates that they believe will win, meaning individuals that they then can help pressure in terms of larger policies. Next slide. Finally, are extremist candidates changing the rules of democracy to help them gain power? We believe that some of the restructuring around how folks engage in the electoral process um, is being driven um, and prioritized as white nationalists seek to change the rules of the game because of demographic growth and the expansion of exclusion um, in American society. This information that you just saw on the slide was put together by the National Institute on Money and State Politics. They have developed and are, are, are looking at continuing to develop a set of tools that lifts up this information um, for both organizations and, and donors at the local level. What we believe is that this information will allow us to target um, far-right donors, be able to follow the money and to lift that money up so that it is both visible and discussed in campaigns. Um, and finally, to give us a better understanding of the grassroots networks that are being built to support extremist candidates in the United States. And when I say extremists, <clears throat> I mean those candidates who are opposed to, exclusive, to inclusive democracy, meaning they are opposed to people-centered governance, transparent government, and accountable government, and seek to create a state, a white-only ethno state, that is grounded in violence and exclusion. There is lots that we do not know today about the flow of alt-right dollars. It is not simply any longer about boots on the ground, but the ballots that are being cast in the United States. The alt-right movement is seeking political power in the United States. And what this information tells us is that they are beginning to have real success in reshaping campaigns. Even if they lose those campaigns, they are likely to walk away with lists of new supporters in their local communities, lessening their dependence on donors outside of their states. It is a real crisis and one that needs to be acknowledged and dealt with. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, so I hope now we have a better sense of, of the structure of these right-wing uh, authoritarian movements that are, that are bubbling up in this country. Uh, I wanna take this opportunity to kind of open up the floor to our panelists and, and let a kind of more organic conversation follow. Uh, if folks in the crowd here are interested in uh, asking their own questions, I would encourage you to write them into the chat so we can kind of call through as, as we go. Um, we know now, yeah, a little bit about what these movements look like. Can you all talk a little bit about some of what their weaknesses are and how they've been exploited in the past, how we can continue as funders and organizers to exploit them today? I'm surprised we're not all jumping in at the same time. So I will say just really quickly, a few of the weaknesses that um, alt-right funding, or let's just say funding on the right faces, is that in terms of foundation dollars, the foundation dollars are not as significant as dollars on our side. Um, but how their dollars are used is quite a challenge for us. So dollars that right-wing organizations receive tend to be general support dollars. They tend to be multi-year grants. 
those dollars tend to be focused on building a pipeline of leaders and activists across sectors. Um, they tend to have a broad-based movement approach um, to constructing their organizations. But with that said, what we should remember is that the majority of Americans do not adhere um, to the values um, and the ideas of, of, of the right, um, particularly the, the racist right. And so in ways that we can begin to invest in moving both public opinion, and that means by addressing the real inequalities that exist in our society, we tend to be very successful. When we tend to speak truth to power um, in electoral, cultural, and social arenas, we tend to gain larger support from the American public. So some of it is about being clear in our vision. Um, and when we are clear in our vision in a way that is inclusive, not silo building, not exclusive, but grounded in kind of the pluralistic idea of a multiracial democracy, we do tend to track to attract more power to our side um, from, from community bases. So, you know, the far right has a hard time making its case on the ground, but when left um, unchallenged um, and when left uncritiqued, um, they can build those bases and those bases tend to be very, very loyal. So, so Sam, in response to your question, uh, a couple, a couple of thoughts. Um, you know, one is that uh, there are some kind of odd bedfellow coalitions that have been put together by the by the right in this time, uh, and probably the most obvious one um, that's gotten a lot of press and a lot of discussion is the extent to which conservative evangelicals have backed Trump. Um, and there are, there are good reasons why they have, because the Trump um, uh, government is rewarding their loyalty with all kinds of things, with the Kavanaugh appointment, of course, it's before it, a packing federal judiciary, doing other things for them, advancing this notion that Christians are persecuted and um, need especially protected religious liberty right and so on and so forth um, and also there's a through line through part of the um, Christian right base that really sees themselves is the cornerstone of America America is a, a Christian nation so there's a white Christian nationalism that dovetails then with the more explicit racial nationalism of the far right so there's some glue there um, but I'll tell you what there are a lot of evangelicals who aren't down with that. They're not down with the more explicit racism. Certainly both people of color evangelicals, whether African-American, Latinx, Asian, and so forth. Um, not to say there is an anti-black racism also within some other communities of color, um, but that are not down with that agenda. And there are actually quite a number of um, white evangelicals who are offended by the racism of the Trump administration. Um, and, and actually deeply believe in the idea of racial reconciliation. Now, it may, may not match what you or I or others on this call might think of as racial justice, but they, do, they don't believe in racial domination. Part of the challenge that we have in terms of our own movement building is many of our organizations on the left aren't in conversation with those kinds of constituencies. You know, if we go back 40 years to the period that Suzanne spent a lot of her time talking about, um, organizers like Paul Weirich, whom Suzanne mentioned explicitly, um, were trying to think, where are we going to get a mass social base for a set of politics? It wasn't an automatic thing. It's hard to get masses of people to vote for taking their political rights and their money and their salaries and in, in, in pushing that stuff upwards uh, right, and, and redistributing it uh, to economic and political elites. You put that on the ballot, not many people are going to vote for it, right? If you put out a tax cut for millionaires ballot initiative, on, who's going to vote for that? Well, Paul Weirich and others realized that there was an untapped, un non-political um, potential base of support in evangelicals, uh, and they went out and they built cultural and political and media institutions 
to expand their movement beyond who is already showing up. Seldom do conversations among progressives on the left really consider who else can we bring in where we don't have any relationships already. We have to think much more expansively uh, about the we than, we than we currently do. We need other kinds of institutions um, and projects that expand, that actually reflect the belief in multiracial democracy and organizing across difference by, by building and practicing that. So I do think that there's some lessons from how the right's going about um, building new coalitions um, that the left can learn from, not, not mimic, right? We're going to go for different folks, but really learn from in terms of building a, a mass infrastructure, right, um, for ourselves. So I think those are a couple of the key lessons. Um, and then I, I, just, I do want to reflect also that Eric mentioned a, a number of the keystone uh, differences between conservative philanthropy uh, and, and right wing philanthropy. And some of these findings were produced in a great report, which we can send a link to later, that the National Committee on Responsive Philanthropy put out back in, in the 90s, and more research, research um, bears this out. But in addition to all the things that have been mentioned, the long game, playing the long game, things like that, that Suzanne talked about and so forth, um, these folks also were committed to two additional things. One was dramatic social and economic transformation, not sort of nibbling around the edges. They were willing to say, we're going to fundamentally change the rules of the game. It's possible to do that if we're disciplined and we're in it for the long haul. And the second is they were willing to experiment and to fail and to learn from those failures, right, and to, and to stick with their program and not abandon proven leaders who experimented and failed with certain projects. A good example, one example then in my comments here, you know, um, back in the 80s, they, they launched a new TV network, right? It was like a private TV network for a core right-wing base. They were launching from radio into TV. Why are a bunch of people were involved in this? And it was a spectacular disaster. They finally closed it down, $8 million in the red. Somebody had to retire the debt. It was a mess. But they learned a lot of things about that and uh, about how to do and not do TV. And one of the things that happened is they trained up a guy named Roger Ailes, who 15 years later will go on and become the, the director of news for Fox News, which succeeded spectacularly, as spectacularly as the initial um, effort had failed. And so sticking with you know, your ideological vision, sticking with your vision of social transformation, being willing to take risks, being willing to stick with um, approved leaders, even when particular experiments don't take, and to return to those ideas uh, in the future and not abandon them, are also hallmarks of how the right is built, the kind of infrastructure Suzanne was referring to. Thank you, Tarso. I want to turn to a question from one of the members of the audience here. Um, we have a question here. Does anyone have access to their uh, to the right wing's grassroots fundraising training agendas and maybe more broadly how transparent are these organizations how open to the public are they uh, how top down are they run and can they be infiltrated understand is um their organizations and, and trainings are probably in most cases almost as open to the public as as ours um as, as our side um i think if we're talking about dark money um the challenge around tracking kind of grassroots dollars um is really the fact that we don't have uh public financing and public campaign laws um that lift up lift up where those dollars originate and um, and how they flow. In, in terms of found right-wing foundations, like um, all foundations, they are required uh, to report to the IRS. They're um, most put out annual reports uh, that allow you to um, kind of get a sense of where most dollars are, are flowing. Um, but I would say in, in, in terms of, of private trainings, um, I'm sure they exist in, in the same way that they exist on, on, on our side. I, w I wanted to add something about the, um, where we could intervene. All right. Okay. Um, I, don't, I don't have um, 
specific examples on this, but I think I just wanted to make a comment that I think the right um, in working with youth is kind of, you know, traveling on dangerous ground and that even, no, no matter how much they try to eliminate left-leaning professors and, you know, left-leaning books and, you know, all the cleanup of, of universities that they're doing, they have a hard time, I think, uh, fighting against youth culture. That I think that's the major major challenge challenge to them. Um, the the high levels of freedom and creativity, ingenuity within the culture. Um, the fact that it is increasingly multicultural. Um, I, even the <laughs> Campus Crusade for Christ changed their name to CRU, C-R-U, um, amidst tremendous debate um, because I think they thought a CRU, as in sounding like C-R-E-W, uh, would be cooler. Uh, I thought that was a little signal or something, but also they, it had to do with uh, not wanting to offend Muslims with using the word crusade. But I think that um, race is a stumbling block for them in such a great way. And as you said, it's an increased multiracial culture and multicultural cu culture that becomes a greater and greater block. I think the place where we could, could fail or lose on this is um, if we don't demonstrate some sort of, I don't know, I can't think of a better language to use, but a moral core. And by that, I mean, not so much as you would have a moral core, if that's a religious core, but a core that has principles and values that is demonstrated throughout all of the unleashed uh, pleasure and joy that, that we have. But I, I think that, I don't think they, ha they have the territory that when you, when you look at the numbers of how many people in, in terms of younger people are, are supporting, um, radical or, or progressive folks. It's, you know, it's a very small percentage on the, on, the, on the conservative right and a very large percentage on the radical slash progressive. And I think it's because of those many things uh, are combining with the love of, you know, the, the desire for different kinds of freedoms, the desire for, you know, unleashed uh, joy and pleasure, all of those, all of those things. So in that battle, I think we had to keep that, keep that going, you know, keep respecting that. I don't mean keep it going, keep respect, respecting that and younger and younger, gener younger, younger generations as they grow up, but also to figure out how, how we hold that center. And we usually hold that through movement work or through social change. That's the thing that keeps us having a core. Thanks, Suzanne. I want to bring another question in that kind of piggybacks off of what you're talking about. Uh, having a strong moral core, uh, following principles, uh, you know, putting putting our values kind of front and center is, is a thing that I think we strive to do in progressive movements. And it's a question here that's saying, you know, do we have a value on the left of not using money to make things happen in the same way that the right is willing to do? Um, is the right has organized money? Maybe we have organized people. Is, is there a difference there? Uh, and, and, and would you know, some sort of dramatic increase in funding, would that test our moral core or our, our values? And, and who's that a question to? Is that to anyone? Yeah, please jump in. Wow. Well, well look, I, I'm not sure. You know, money and resources are always, always useful. So we can just start with that, that basic understanding. I don't know if it's a question about the amount of money or the restrictions that we put on dollars. Um, you know, there, there are cases where uh, an organization has been funded, um, you know, for 10 years by a donor or uh, a foundation um, and, you know, it's probably pretty clear that organization is going to be funded for 10 more years. 
um, yet we will make that organization jump through hoops every single year um, to get the money we all know that um, we're going to give that organization because they're, they're deserving of it. So we spend our time um, with that organization uh, forcing them to always be in courting mode, if I can use the term courting, rather than exploring, right, how they can partner with philanthropy to advance their, their issues. And so I think the, the major difference between funding on the right and the left um, still remains. It is the fact that we put uh, an inordinate amount of restrictions on the dollars that we uh, provide to um, our organizations. Two, we never give these organizations enough dollars um, to build real grassroots support in terms of, of dollars. And three, we never provide them the support to do what the right always allows, well, primarily allows, which is allowing organizations to test, innovate, and fail um, amongst strategies, amongst tactics. Um, and, and so we are just interesting enough on a call where we're talking about conservative funders, um, ideologically conservative funders, in actuality, we're the real conservatives when it comes to philanthropy and supporting our grassroots base. Yeah, I just want to um, say, I think that um, movements need all kinds of resources. Um, it's, I think the notion that the, that social justice movements have people and, and the right has money uh, is not quite right on either score. Um, you know, I think that if Harry Belafonte hadn't paid MLK's rent, he would have a, a lot harder time, you know, stepping up into the role that he stepped into, just to use one famous example, the role of you know, private philanthropy that is um, rooted in core values of justice and equality has been essential, has been fundamental to the capacity of um, uh, social movements in this country to thrive in whatever historic period. So I think that sometimes there's a, um, there can be a shameful kind of conversation about money, like money is a dirty thing. Well, Often how money is made is dirty. The question is, once it's made, what do you do with it? Um, you know, and uh, are we ashamed to use resources that are available? I would say that this is a moment where um, it's our moral responsibility to bring everything we've got, right? Everything we've got, all of our talents, all of our intelligence, all of our networks and relationships, all of our resources, human, financial, and otherwise, to the project of um, keeping open and building the possibility of a real, multi real multiracial democracy uh, in, in this country. Uh, and that's our job, right? And whatever we can bring to that, and we're all gonna bring different you know, kinds of things um, to that. So, um, you know, the, as, a, as a, um, a one time mentor of mine, Gary, Gary Delgado, said the only problem with tainted money is taint enough of it for social justice work. Um, and this is an interesting moment in, in the transfer of, of generational wealth, right? I don't know exactly who's on this call and where, where people's relationship to inherited money and other things are, but it's interesting. A number of those right-wing um, philanthropists who really helped engineer a right-wing turn in the United States 45, 50 years ago were running family foundations. And some of them were coming into influence of family foundations for the first time. When Richard Chafee ended up taking over the Chafee Foundation, which is a cornerstone along with Olin and Bradley and Coors and a variety of others in this period, <clears throat> the Family Foundation was funding very mainstream stuff. They were funding the libraries and you know kinds of things, you know, mainstream charity. Uh, it totally transformed that 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 philanthropy, right? Um, saw a need, and I thought it was a very mistaken need, had a vision, a very mistaken and dangerous mission. Um, and use those resources to transform society and did it in partnership, in many cases, a kind of accountable, accountable partnership with right-wing um, you know, leaders. So I think the question is not, is it inappropriate to use money? It's really, what are the accountability mechanisms? How is 
funding for movements not overly directive? How is it done in appropriate partnership? And in, in that case, I'm sure that there's a lot of expertise with others on the call, the work that Mijo, you do at Social Justice Fund Northwest, others at RG do. There's a lot of experience to draw on that to make sure that the resource of money doesn't distort, right, um, the priorities of social justice organizing, but happens in appropriate partnership. But that's 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 a that's an easily solvable. Not, not that's not hard work. But that's a solvable problem, not a barrier to um, for providing financial support to social justice work. Cool. I'm gonna. Uh take over the, the moderation at this point to bring us home. You guys have already um, kind of anticipated where we were gonna go um, with our closing questions. So we're gonna continue in that vein and Suzanne, I'll um, uh, ask you to take first crack at it um, since you didn't get a chance to chime in on this question. Um, the, the, the closing question is really about, um, so what do we do? Um, where do we go from here? Um, what, um, what do we do with all this information, right? That, um, that, that you all have been sharing and that we've been synthesizing over the last hour. Um, what, uh, um, what strategies um, do, like what, whether it's, whether we're looking at kind of like, what are the weaknesses that we can exploit, the, the, the kind of fissures that we can go for, whether it's strategies um, that we see that are successful on the right wing that we, no, we can apply to our own, or whether there are, um, you know, other proactive um, and creative, um, you know, strategies that we should be using to get out of this dumpster fire right now. Um, being in philanthropy, I'm really resonating with everything that Eric just said about um, things that we know that the right has, that right wing philanthropy has done that would um, that would work on left wing philanthropy. I, you know, I I want to say real quickly that I don't go to a single philanthropy conference. I have not in my entire career in philanthropy been to a single philanthropy conference where grantees were not saying to funders, you know what you need to do, you need to trust us, you need to give us general operating funds, you need to give us multi monthly year funding and get out of the way. And I do not understand why we're having that same conversation for a decade when the right wing has been not even having that conversation but just doing it for decades. So forgive the digression. Um, but I want to say that explicitly to the people, the audience members here who have roles in philanthropy, whether they are um, trustees at a family foundation or they go to philanthropy conferences and have the opportunity to talk to other philanthropists. Um, there is some very specific, some very specific evidence pointing to these very specific changes that we can be making. But whether we're talking to philanthropists and organizers, what do we do with this information? Where do we go from here? Suzanne, you want to take first crack? Sure. Um, I want to just focus on still on young people if I can to stay with my stay with my theme, you know. So the question is, you know, what can we do with and for the large numbers of young people now attracted to progressive or radical social change? That that to me is a is a critical question, and I think what we can what we can learn from from you know what I talked about tonight in terms of what the right has done that we can take the long view and build layers of movement leadership. And I think we, we badly, badly need that. We spent so long not building those layers and then suddenly we discovered young people and started having a group of older people at the, at the you know, major leadership positions and organizations and bringing in young people without the kind of training and, and uh, care that would be, would be needed in order to make people, you know, be able to move. I'm not very much on hierarchy, so it's not a matter of moving upward, but moving into a, into a sort of shoulder to shoulder work. So the cry that I have all, this, all the time now is for us to get more funding of training. You know, I think we do a pretty good job with popular education, we do a pretty good job with political education, but we don't do a great job of organizing. That's not, a, that's not our strong suit, I think, in, in the movement now. And so I think if we had an increased number of organizing schools that would work on the community level and be uh, focused on growing and activating a base, that kind of, that kind of organizing, so that you're you know, learning the basic, basic skills of that, 
And I'll give you an example of it. I'll just, and then I'll move, move on because I have way too many things I want to say on this one. Uh, my example is uh, last week I was coming back from a Southern Movement Assembly organizing intensive, and I was talking with a friend here in the South who I think is one of our finest local organizers and teachers and political uh, analysts in, in the South, and she lives in Mississippi. And I was, I was admiring her skills as I have for a number of years now. And I, I thought, you know, for $100,000, we could have her travel around the South doing pop-up organizing schools in different organizations, you know, where come in for a week, have, have you know, pe people have youth programs, they have new, new entry people in their organizations, have that kind of organizing school, then, then move on, come back again later in the year you know, do the follow-up on it. Something as simple as that would make great change for us. Um, but I think that there's not enough mon money put into the development of skills and the de development of young people. And I think that we can't afford two things. We can't afford to waste talent. And we, we just cannot, cannot afford to have our organizations not staffed fully and with full strength at this point. And so in order to get there, it's going to take a training and experience, I believe. Great. Thank you. Could not agree more. Um, let's see. Uh, Tarso, you want to, Tarso or Eric, either one of you, I jump in on this. What do we do? Well, look, I think that, um, one of the biggest dangers of this moment, I've already talked about the organized right and the threat of authoritarianism and so forth. I actually think one of the biggest dangers in this moment is that um, people retreat from the moment. It's so overwhelming. Every day is like another, you know, um, year's worth of disasters, right? And so there's a lot of reason for folks to want to hide out and just think, you know, my little piece can't possibly leverage a change, right, in, uh, in what's happening right now. I think it's one of the most dangerous things that could happen, and I actually think it's one of the goals of the way that um, this administration is conducting itself, and one of the goals of the kind of media, especially social media blitz that we get all, all the time. Um, it's disanimating, and it's, a, it's actually a tactic used by authoritarian governments where you get to a point where common sense is not to trust any source of information or believe in much of anything because everything is propaganda. And so then, then what do you believe? So I think that cynicism um, about our capacity to make change in a moment like this is one of the most important things that we can fight against. I think, uh, and so in a moment where we need to mobilize everything we've got, we have to resist that. And this speaks to another challenge that I think we can learn from um, the right around. And, you know, I'm skeptical. There are people who say, oh, we have to imitate the way the right builds its organizations and movements. And I, mostly I think that's wrongheaded. But there, there is a problem among progressives in the left often in thinking too small. In thinking too small, right? If we are serious about building real multiracial democracy, which is to say democracy, you know, in the United States, that is an enormous task, right? And it's going to require many more people than we currently have organized in anything that we could call progressive or um, a left formation or movement. Um, and so we have to think larger. We have to think larger in terms of our vision. We need to be, think larger in terms of the way we talk about our work and who we can reach and bring in. We need to think larger in terms of the resources we're going to mobilize. Some of us with really big vision, we're like, we have a vision for transforming the United States and we're going to do it $100,000 a year. That's not going to happen. So I think we need to be less apologetic, right, about what we need to achieve real social transformation. And it's not all about money. But part of it is really about money and being unapologetic about being serious about the financial resources that we're gonna to need to, to leverage. The right's not embarrassed, right, at all about what it needs. It's not embarrassed about, you know, the $2 billion in, you know, off-track money that can be figured out since Citizens United or the 
hundreds of millions in, in dark funding. It's not embarrassed about any of that. The only time he tries to hide it, is, as Eric says, is when it could be, there could be a political cause. It could, it could sort of set that, right, for, for revealing that. Um, I think we need to be much more honest as a movement with each other um, and with ourselves about what we're trying to build and what it's going to take to mobilize it. We actually need to think bigger, not smaller, um, and be realistic about the infrastructure that's, that's going to require. You know, if somebody came with you with a, to a, with you to to you with a business plan saying they were going to transform the world, you know, on fifty thousand dollars a year, you might say, that, "Well, that's a startup grant, but you show me how this gets to to scale." Now's the time to talk about not only the small building blocks, but the the bigger pieces that we need in order to affect the, the change we want. And uh, and I just I thank you for um, inviting me to part of this conversation with RG. I know we're running down the time now. I'll just say really quickly in the, in the last couple of minutes, look, I, I think moving forward, we have to understand that we are in a new moment. And, um, you know, I was a person who thought Trump would win the primaries and then would ultimately, um, ultimately find some pathways that might allow them to, to, to be president. It really was a new moment. And I still remember those who were in shock the next day um, and for over a year saying that we are in the midst of a crisis, right? I heard it from donors. I heard it all over philanthropy. We are in a crisis. We are in a critical moment in our nation's history. But if we are actually in a critical moment, it is time for philanthropy and donors to act like we are in a critical moment, right? It is time to really put up or, or shut up in terms of building a grassroots response. At the end of the day, there are two things that will defeat the right. The first is building a robust grassroots mass-based movement that is putting forth an alternative vision. And the second is out politicized. That means building more political power than is being consolidated on the right. And it is not, I think, you know, I'd love to say that there is some complex science um, to doing this, but, but there's not. We engage understanding that we have to push back and steal the oxygen from this white nationalist movement, and we have to continue our work in dismantling white supremacy and systemic discrimination uh, in America. And we do that through grassroots organizing, and we do that through political formation. Um, and we have the groups, we have the leaders out there, we certainly have the vision, it's time to invest in them. I just think at the end of the day, if we can trust our leaders and our organizations to get us through this moment, the future is really bright in grounding an inclusive democracy that is people-centered, accountable, and transparent. But we have to get through this moment. And philanthropy is frankly not stepping up as if this is a crisis. All right, thanks so much to all three of you. Um, really, really brilliant minds um, that we are um, that we are privileged to have um, sharing their expertise and knowledge and uh, insights with us. Um, I just want to sum up a, a few things that I heard in this in this closing piece as um, uh, some pearls that we can take away with us. One is um, to invest in organizing, in training, and leadership development. And uh, I think that Suzanne's analysis is completely right. That philanthropy on the left really, really underinvests. In those things, and then exp and then penalizes um, grassroots organizations for not having the skills that they haven't had the resources to train for or the time to think about because they're spending all their time trying to raise money from the same foundations that won't fund that work. Um, so invest in organizing, training, and leadership development, particularly with youth. Um, from Tarso, this piece about resisting cynicism and refusing to retreat um, to uh, our are safe and happy places when the world is scary as it really is um, and I really this is a drum that I've been pounding as well that hope is not something that just happens because it's easy hope is a strategic choice that we make 
um, because without it, we will lose. So you don't hope because it happened and like, oh, I'm suddenly feeling hopeful. You feel hopeful because you want to win and that's what you know it's going to take. Um, and I love this, dream big, right? Um, do we actually want to win? Um, if we actually want to win, then we have to dream really big and we're going to need many more people than we currently have. And I also um, love what Suzanne had said about that, that about that earlier. Actually, now I, I'm, I can't remember who said what, but this piece around who is who is out there that probably agrees with us that we're not talking to, and how are we not talking to them in ways that they can hear, um, is something that the right has done well, and that we need to do better. And finally, uh, from Eric, build a gr robust grassroots mass movement and out politicize the right. Um, that's it. That's all we got to do, and we got this. That's it, right? We got it. We got it. So I, um, you know, one thing I didn't say in my intro is that I've had the privilege to, you know, partner with RG um, and RG constituents a lot over the years. I really, really believe in the potential of this community. Um, I know it's not just RGers on this call, but I want to thank RG for hosting it. I, I'm seeing already in the chats, if you don't have your chats opened up, take a look because there's already a conversation happening about grassroots fundraising trainings and People are already building together um, in the chat thread. So um, talk to one another, uh, help to build this movement, help to think about how to fund a movement that is responsive and robust and nimble and broad based. Um, and we will win. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate you. Yeah. Yes, thanks. Thanks so much for inviting us. Thank you. Thanks, Sam, everyone. Good night. Night. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night.